Welcome to our third meeting for the Bible study entitled The Light of the World. Whether you received a flyer or a, an invitation, electronic uh, um, or, or printed or in any other form, um, we have invited all to come and discover Jesus Christ as he really is. And that is mainly from the Gospels. We ask each one of us, uh, have you ever wondered who Jesus really was? And even more, have you ever questioned the views of other people about him? Our study for tonight can be found on discoverthrough.ie. We have already covered two lessons. They are on the screen, the world in which Christ lived and the babe of Bethlehem. It's very easy. You just type in discoverthrough.ie, look for that tab called Bible studies, and in there you'll find light of the world. Three options there, uh, one uh, that we are doing right now, that is the Zoom meeting. Another one very helpful to all of you would be to enroll to Bible studies online. And then you can go ahead of our presentations, do them at your own pace. Discovertruth.ie, that's, that's the place where you find not only the lessons, but also the presentations in case you missed any of our previous presentations or you want to share with somebody else. Look in there for Light of the World Bible Study on discovertruth.ie. Today is lesson number three, and it's entitled The Mystery of Emmanuel. As we've done on every other previous uh, presentation, uh, this would be like a table of contents. We'll cover the supreme revelation of God to man, talking about Christ, of course, then uh, what about his dwelling with the Father before the foundation of the world? We'll discuss about Christ in the history of the Old Testament and in the scriptures as foretold by prophets. And then we'll try to bring the, the entire topic to our own lives, talking about uniting God and man. As you know, in uh, our previous uh, lessons, we learned few words. The first lesson, we learned the word biography, which was life writing. And we said this is what the Gospels uh, are doing. They are telling us the biography of Jesus. Uh, during the second lesson, we learned about history, historia. And we said this is an inquiry, uh, seeking for knowledge, discovering, discovering some facts, and then telling those facts through stories. Today, our key word would be incarnation. Incarnation. It comes from two words. Of course, it's, it's easy to see now, but um, you'll find different meanings. It means uh, becoming flesh or uh, entering this environment called flesh, embodiment, let's say. Uh, it may mean clothing with the flesh. In other words, you, you remain that person, but you, you just take another form. Uh, assumption of a form, or in our case, a human form. And in theology or religion, it also means a union of divine and human natures. In a concrete way, we will talk about how Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, became also the Son of Man. So let's start with supreme revelation of God to man. I'll uh, put myself on the right side of the screen. Uh, from time to time, I will disappear from there, but just so that you can, can see me, I can see some of you in my upper part of the screen. Whenever we talk about the biography of uh, any personality or any human being in, in, in the end, we all know that we have to start somehow with the parents or grandparents, somebody who was there before our main character came into play. 
And for any person, you can identify a mentor or a person who gave birth, let's say in, in physical form, uh, but also somebody who led or who called for, for one, whether man or, or, or whether male or female to come to a position or to come uh, uh, under some spotlights. What about Jesus of Nazareth? We know from the story of the gospels that um, he had, of course, parents. We call them by the names found in the gospels, Joseph and Mary. The intriguing fact there would be that Joseph was not the real father of Jesus. Instead, it, mean, it looks like he only had a mother. Now, of course, for, for everybody, this is strange. Uh, but the Bible has a, an explanation. And you'll see when we talk about the Son of God, this explanation really makes sense. If you have a Bible with you, please take it. If not, uh, just look at the screen where we will um, have all the texts available. Our text, starting text, is in um, Luke chapter 1. is the Gospel of Luke, first chapter, from uh, verses 30 to 35. I will not read all of them, but the, the words on the screen are taken from there. When the angel came to Mary and told her that she will have a son, she said, how come? Because I'm a virgin. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. You can see now there's not much room for a father in the picture. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. You have the power of the Most High overshadowing her. And the one that is to be born from her womb is called the Holy One. Now, if we look at the same story now seen from the perspective of John, and if you remember in the first lesson, we said there is one way to tell the story like in a chronological approach, and there's another way to tell it like it's diamond. And then you can see it from different perspectives, different facets of, of uh, a diamond. So John, in his first chapter of the gospel, goes something like this. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. In other words, what we have here is the divine nature of Christ being clearly emphasized. However, in verse 14, we find the other side of the story, which is, may I say, the infleshization of Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. In these two verses, we can see the incarnation. Somebody who was God, now taking also a human form. The word became flesh. The same story or the same concept appears in different parts of the scriptures. And I quoted only three of those taking uh, the writings of Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, and Apostle John. For example, Paul writes to Timothy saying, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He, Jesus Christ, appeared in a body. Peter on uh, his side says, he, Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. By his wounds, you have been healed. And then John is, uh, is uh, may I say, very, very um, clear, leaving no room for negotiation here. He says, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. 
every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge the same is not from God. And probably the, the cornerstone of this doctrine or of this teaching of incarnation is found in Colossians, where Paul says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. This is absolutely amazing. This text is like, is like an atomic bomb. You have so much power, so much energy, so much potential in just, may I say, a little baby born in Bethlehem, a teacher, um, traveling itinerant preacher, traveling from Galilee to Judea. In a Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. We said this first section is the supreme, revel we, we are trying to cover or to demonstrate the supreme revelation of, of God in Christ. And in the book of Hebrews, the author says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation. In other version, you'll find the exact imprint of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So you can see God spoke in many ways, but through Jesus Christ, through his son, he gave us the ultimate revelation of his nature. So going to the next uh, section, dwelling with the Father before the foundation of the world. As we remember from um, our previous lesson, there was a time when some um, wise men came from the East inquiring about the birth of the King of the Jews. And the current King at that time, Herod the Great, uh, some on the high priest and the other teachers of the law inquiring about the place or the time where this king would be born. And the high priest and the other teachers of the law were very clear saying, oh, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem because the prophet has said that in Micah chapter five, verse two. And the quote taken from that book was, but you Bethlehem, you're not the smallest, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. You can already see the nature of the person that is to be born is not only a human nature. It's somebody who transcends the time, who's beyond centuries or beyond our, our way of reckoning the time. And if we just read again the verses in the Gospel of John, I'll emphasize something else now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, right? From the beginning. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the father so we can understand there was another history before the history that we know starting from bethlehem on of course we represent jesus whether in churches or on different uh, wallpapers screens posters in in different ways we are trying to highlight in a way uh, his glory for us glory is like a radiance like like light um but the Bible puts, even in Jesus' words, some things about his glory. Glory being, as we said, reflecting the entire nature of God the Father. And now, he said, these are Jesus' words in John chapter 17. And now, Father, he was praying, 
glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And some verses later, he says, Father, I wanted those you have given me, the apostles, to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. I think it becomes clear that Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, you know, we know him as Jesus Christ, uh, but before he became the babe of Bethlehem, he was the Son of God. And he had that kind of loving relation with the, with the Father and with the Holy Spirit before the creation of the world. Now, we said we will cover the story of Jesus from the Gospels, but the Gospels are not brought to us in a vacuum. They, they are part of the entire um, book that we call the Holy Scripture. So let's make a few steps only about uh, in, in the history of the Old Testament. You know, that, that Gospel of John, as I said, it is like a diamond. You can read the same verses and emphasize or see, see a potential in, in all those words. For example, in verse 3, John says, through him, through Jesus Christ, through the Son, through the Word, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, everything that you see has been done through the word. In other words, like God says, and it takes shape or it takes form. Through him, all things were made. So then everything we read in Genesis, in Exodus, in, in all the other books in the Bible, everything there, everywhere where God acted, it was through his son. And just to bring you one story, you remember people of Israel, this nation was... Um, um, obtaining or getting their independence when they left Egypt. We've just celebrated Easter. And that's like a, I mean, the world around us says Easter, the Jews will say uh, Passover. And it's, it's that uh, remembrance of a huge event in their history. When former slaves in Egypt, the Hebrews came out and they were led by Moses towards the promised land. And if you remember, their journey didn't take only a few days, but was quite a long journey, tiresome. And um, many times they had to face different challenges. Uh, the main ones being, for example, what do we eat or what do we drink, especially in the wilderness. And there were some times when they really cried out and there was like a fight uh, criticizing the leaders because they have not provided the right amount of water or, or food or something else in there. And two instances were, are there where um, Moses took his staff and, and hit the, ro the, the rock. And out of the rock came water. Uh, when it, it says there that it came water, please don't think it was just a little spring of water because there were hundreds of thousands of people. And that would be a very, very long queue for them to drink. I, I imagine something like in this picture, like a waterfall, like, like a full, full uh, or, or a cluster of, of springs of water coming from the rock. What is very interesting is that Apostle Paul, reviewing the history, says something like this. I don't want you brothers to be ignorant of the fact that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea. In other words, they, they all went through the Red Sea, you know that, and it's like the symbol of baptism. And they've been all led by that pillar of, of light and the cloud coming out of Egypt and taking them on the other side of, of the wilderness. But Paul continues saying, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink 
for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Now, please, when you read here spiritual food or spiritual drink or spiritual rock, it doesn't mean it's just a metaphoric language. They really ate for 40 years. They really drank water for 40 years. And the rock that followed them or was in their um, nearby them, wherever they were, because of course it was not the same mountain moving from here to there. That one means that God was wherever they were. So when it says here, spiritual food and spiritual drink, please don't take it metaphorically. Paul really says it, the rock was Christ. And I'm not interested really in the, in the matter itself, what kind of stones or rocks or minerals were there, but instead knowing that Jesus Christ, before we came to know him as the baby in Bethlehem, he was there with his people. And if we go to the New Testament, only in the Gospel of John, you can find at least eight to 10 sayings, famous sayings of Jesus, where he says, and you can, of course, take it as metaphorical language, symbolic language, but in the same time, some of you and myself also, we can testify these are real words. He said, I am the bread of life. I'm the living water. I'm the light of the world. That's the title of our seminar, right? I'm the door or the good shepherd, the true vine. One famous saying says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That has been so, so visible, so manifest in the history of Israel, even coming out of Egypt. The way, the truth, the life. And when he uh, resurrected Lazarus from the dead, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. But probably the most uh, uh, challenging episode took place when he was um, confronting with some teachers of the law. And they were, they were so distressed by his sayings. So they came to that point where they said to him, are you thinking that you're greater than our father Abraham? You know, in, in each nation, you have some father figure. You have somebody who's, who's the pick. You always listen to Americans and they all point out to their former presidents. And those, those not, not those in, in our century, but mostly uh, from like the forefathers. They will always point out to those heroes. Every nation does that. So for the Jews, Abraham was like the anchor. And putting Jesus face to face with Abraham, they said, are you somehow or claiming to be greater than Abraham? And the most, you know, it's, for them was outrageous, for us is really enlightening. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I'm, my English is not my first language, as you can see from my accent and some mistakes that I'm doing. But um, I think everybody can read this one and see, this is not proper English grammar, is it? Probably you could, you could have said it differently, but here it's a, it's a theological motif. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, the bread, the wine, and, and so on. Here it says, before Abraham was, which is like, you know, before Abraham was, um, sorry, before Abraham was uh, born or was um, called by God or becoming aware of the plan of salvation and all this, I am. Of course, he could have said, I was also. But it's not that. It's, it's like, I am. I'm, I'm before Abraham. I'm during Abraham days. I'm after Abraham. I'm, from, I'm like Alpha and Omega. I am. It's like a present tense. And it's not only the present tense, but it's, it's emphasizing a, an unchanging nature. That is very, very important. The divine nature is unchangeable. However, he took a human form also. Number four, his coming was foretold by prophets. 
he was not only active in their own situations or events, but he was there also mentioned many, many times in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, some, some theologians counted all this and said there are about, or even more than 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ. Of course, the time won't, won't be on to our advantage to cover them, but I'm inviting you now, if you have the time, please, on the same discovered truth.ie, you can find a se Bible seminar called Focus on Prophecy. And in there, probably they will, they will cover like 50 or 100 different prophecies about Jesus Christ. I'll highlight only one. In the book of Isaiah, and by the way, in Isaiah, you find many prophecies about Jesus Christ, and he seems to be the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. In Isaiah, you find this text, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, we don't know of any child, not even Jesus Christ, uh, didn't have a, a birth certificate saying there, Emmanuel. Because Emmanuel, it's a key, it's a, it's a code. And we find this in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, where it says something like this. You remember Joseph, Mary's husband? Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, said the angel to him. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this, says the gospel writer Matthew, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And Matthew explains to us in the bracket saying, which means God with us. In a way, this is the mystery of Emmanuel. It's the son of God coming to, to live with us, taking the shape or the form of a human, and by that, bringing God to us. That's why we advertise this book. We are giving it for free. You can... Um, request a hard copy of the book Desire of Ages. It's all about Jesus, all about Emmanuel. The, the title itself comes from a prophecy, from a prophecy um, where uh, the Son of God is, in, is called the Desire of All Nations. So um, we are giving uh, for free this book. And of course, you can also download it from Discover Truth as an ebook, Desire of Ages, covering the entire life of Jesus. The last part, what about uniting God and man? This is, Diane, the why that you asked in the beginning, like why would, would this um, incarnation take place? Jesus, as we know, was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. For those who don't know, Nazareth was, was not quite the best place. It's like, you know, every, every town, every city has some quarter or some neighborhood where you don't want to live, where you don't want to send your kids to school, where when you drive, you want to have uh, your, um, your car locked, right? So in the Gospel of John, there is this story where Jesus is calling different disciples. And one of them is Philip. Philip followed Jesus. But Philip had also another friend called Nathanael. And he said, I'll go and call my friend. He has to listen to this also, or he has to come with us also. So Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Remember the 300 prophecies? And this is the proof here. So Philip said to him, you know, that." one that Moses wrote about, the prophets also wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? That's, that's Nathanael. You know? Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? And Philip, um, in, in a, 
non not fighting, non-combat way, mostly like defensive, said, come and see. It's like, would you have your personal encounter with Jesus instead of me telling you about him? So he brought Philip to, uh, so he brought Nathanael to Jesus. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Come on, who, who can read the soul or, or the heart of, of a human being and say, that's a good guy. There's no deceit in him. Or, only God can, can do that. So Nathanael is, is, is uh, 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 of course, surprised. And he says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. You know, Nathanael was praying and Jesus didn't need Philip to tell him about that. He said, I've already seen you. You remember before Abraham was, I am. The same story here. Before Philip called you, I am. I was there with you. I'm, I'm here. I will be also there. So it's, it's not, not only the present time, but it's, it's that uh, continuous presence, omnipresence. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And can, can you see that Nathanael goes from one extreme to the other? First was like, Nazareth, come on, spare me. I, I don't want to have anything. And now understanding that God really reads his life, his mind. He says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw under the fig tree, <laughs> you will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I think this is where the why comes in. Why would Jesus come on this planet? So that he would be the bridge, the staircase, the connection between heaven and the earth. He would take the human form, be, being in the same time son of God and son of man. This is the mystery of Israel, of, of Emmanuel. And we cannot cover it, of course, in, in one lesson only. That's why we are inviting you to do your studies on your, at your own pace and still come with us. For now, I say thank you for your attention. Our fourth lesson next Thursday will cover the childhood and youth of Jesus. Those years that are somehow hidden and yet we have some insights about how Jesus uh, grew up in Nazareth. See you next Thursday. And I say thank you for now. <laughs>